check this. All right, so should we be all set? Okay, so thanks everybody for coming out here today, especially on short notice. It's awesome to be here. My name is TJ. I made the trek here from Michigan. I was in Lansing, Michigan this morning, and now I'm all the way out here. I, I give these talks sometimes, and I always like to open the talk with uh, telling a story or a joke about how I can relate to wherever it is I'm speaking. And to be honest with you, I had to stretch a little bit to come up with a Seattle story, because I've, I've never been here. Right? I've been in this town for about six hours. But I did. I searched long and hard, and I came up with something. So this is me at 13 years old. As you can see, I was totally into basketball. I was also quite good, as you can tell by those two trophies that I was holding, you know, not to, not to brag or anything. But young me was totally into basketball. And when I was 10 years old, my parents got me tickets to go see the Detroit Pistons play the Seattle Supersonics. And 10-year-old me was pumped about this because not only was this my first basketball game, not only did I get to see Sean Kemp and Gary Payton from the Supersonics, but check out that start time, 8 p.m. means I was going to be up way past my bedtime, <laughs> which is actually the number one thing I remember from this event. Now, unfortunately, this game did not end very well. <laughs> oh my god. So it turns out the mid-90s Supersonics were quite good. Uh, this is Sean Kemp in his prime. Uh, he, he had a pretty good night, uh, so that game did not end very well. But that's basically the closest connection to Seattle I have. A little bit of a stretch. Of course, that has nothing to do with augmented reality, which is what I'm actually here to talk about. I got into AR, I'm just going to be totally honest with you, with just Pokemon Go. I am a Pokemon Go fanatic. I'm really into the game. I am level 40, so not, again, not to brag or anything. If you play the game, you know exactly what that means. If you don't, it just means I make some very questionable use of the time that I have <laughs> playing this game. But I do work, actually, sometimes. I work as a developer advocate for a company called Progress. I hack here. And we're a software development company. We make all sorts of things. But the thing most relevant to this talk, the thing that I work on, is a project called NativeScript. And NativeScript, sort of simply put, is a project that lets you build iOS and Android apps using JavaScript. We also have Angular support as well, so you can build iOS and Android apps using Angular. And I'm going to show you how that works, but this talk is about augmented reality, so I want to start by giving them just sort of a brief history of AR. Why is AR in news now? Why are we talking about it now versus <coughs> five or ten years ago? Then we're going to take a sampling and sort of look at what AR apps are out there today. I, I brought my iPad specifically to demo a few of these things. I'm going to warn you ahead of time that they are very underwhelming, so sort of you can collectively bring down your level of expectations, that would be good. But we are going to look at them. And then finally, the, we're going to build up to just building an app. So I'm going to show you how to build a NativeScript app, uh, how you can tie into some of these AR APIs. We'll take a look at what that looks like. But we're going to start with the history part. And first of all, the, the sort of dictionary definition of AR is basically anything digital any technology that puts digital things into the real world. So if you think of the Pokemon Go example, that is an AR app because the app is taking digital Pokemon and making them appear in the real world when you look through the lens of a phone. Now Pokemon Go is sort of largely credited with bringing AR into the mainstream, but of course Pokemon Go is not the thing that started augmented reality. Uh, the technology actually dates back to this dude who was, uh, his name is see, Ivan Sutherland, who was this guy that was a researcher at Harvard, and he had these, this idea that he was going to use AR for these military s simulations. And I include these pictures. I, the one on the right there, I think, is somewhat misleading, because it makes it look like the, the dude's wearing like a clunky version of Google Glass or something like that. But the thing that's actually doing the work is this enormous like, mainframe-y thing behind him. Uh, and it's actually connected to him through this like crane-like thing that's hanging from the ceiling. And I include this because the story of AR is really a story of just, uh, I guess, increasing processing power or computing power. If you think about what AR does, right, it's, it's taking something digital and making it appear in the real world, but also remembering where that thing is, sometimes collision detection is involved, and to provide that sort of experience, a really seamless experience, you just need a whole lot of processing power. So in the 60s, then, you needed a giant mainframe just to put some basic polygons through these, these crazy lenses. 
Now, I was not around in the 60s. I did not personally experience this thing, but I do remember my very first experience with augmented reality. And I'm curious how many of you remember this as well. Anybody, by show of hands? So we got, we got a few people. So this is sort of known as the glow puck. And the background here is Fox, the network Fox, acquired the rights to the National Hockey League in 1994. And they wanted to boost ratings of hockey. And they had this idea that one of the reasons that casual fans of hockey don't watch as much hockey is because they have a hard time following the puck. So they came up with this actually quite innovative idea. They embedded these LED lights within the hockey puck that gave off some sort of signal, infrared signal, that their cameras could pick up so that they could actually do this effect where the puck glowed and also check how fast the, thing, uh, the puck is moving so they could make those streak things appear as well. So this is pretty innovative. They, they even did things like they had to make sure the pucks maintain the same weight distribution and weight so that it would feel like a hockey puck to the actual players. So it was kind of a cool idea. Now, unfortunately, it's generally considered one of the worst ideas in sports history <laughs> because, as it turns out, a black puck on white ice is not exactly the hardest thing to follow, and uh, sort of making it glow is more obnoxious than actually helpful for the viewing experience. Uh, but, like a lot of things, because it's innovative technology, it led sort of directly to further advances in the field. So the same company that made the glow puck, it was a company called Sports Vision. They went on to work with ESPN to develop what's known as the first in 10 line. Now if you're not a football fan, all you really need to know is that in football there's this line that you have to get to for a first down, and it's not a line that's actually physically on the field. It's, it's not there. But it's nice for the viewers to be able to see it. And so Sports Vision came up with this technology that allows them to paint the first in 10 line into their broadcast. And nowadays, you can't watch a football game without this line being in place. Usually, you can see there's other information on the field. Uh, other sports uh, broadcasts do this as well. If you watch a baseball game, oftentimes the strike zone is sort of placed on the screen. So the glow puck, even though it was sort of, uh, history does not look kind upon the glow puck, I guess to put it nicely, it did lead to some other advancements to how we work with ARJ. <coughs> Now, I include this example specifically because there's actually some really good technical write-ups on this. And the people at Sports Vision said that in the late 90s, it costs the broadcaster something like 25 or 30K just to put that simple first and 10 line on the screen. And it gets down to two. You can see that it took racks of equipment, so they rolled out an entire truck. This again gets at the point that it just takes a lot of processing power, in this case, to just augment a broadcast with a first and 10 line. Now what's interesting about this is that fast forward a handful of years and they say now it's basically one computer that run the, the same augmented reality experience that it took that truck in the late 90s. So this is again the story of AR becoming more powerful, more capable as computing power increases. Now just to quickly get us up to date, the fast forward, this is 2008, BMW is sort of credited with the first direct to consumer application of AR. What they did is they had an ad in a magazine and what you could do is you could take your, your this is 2008, so you're taking your webcam on your desktop computer and you're using Internet Explorer and they had this ActiveX control where it could make a BMW car pop up so you could see it through your, through your webcam. You started to see other technologies. Uh, this is a, a watch company that had this thing where you could put a little, uh, I guess, plastic thing on your wrist and it would sort of digitally show you what the watch looked like on your wrist. A bunch of companies started experimenting with these sort of real-world AR experiences. <laughs> this is something that Disney did in Times Square around 2011. There's other examples of this on the internet, like National Geographic did one where animals go into a mall and get people to react and such. And really, that's where AR was at, a lot of these, these sort of experimental things. The, the last chapter of AR that I want to discuss, though, is the era of wearables. So how many people were at a Google building? How many people know what this is? <laughs> yeah, most people here. Uh, so this is Google Glass. And Google Glass first came out in 2012. Now this is sort of an important uh, sort of point for augmented reality because people have long known that really the optimal experience, the experience everybody wants for AR is for you be able to view these experiences just directly through your face, right? Because these last few examples are all somewhat awkward. 
if you look at this car example, you, you have this magazine, but you're not seeing the car pop out of the magazine. You're like looking at your desktop computer to actually see the car. It's the same thing with the watch. You're not looking down to see, oh, here's what the watch looks like. You're having to look like somewhere else. It's also what makes this video extremely awkward because this woman's not actually looking at the character. She's doing this awkward thing where she's you know, trying to look at the screen and pretend she's seeing the character as well. So this has long been the goal of AR, and Google Glass was sort of the first big consumer attempt to make these, this sort of experience possible. Now, Google Glass's story also didn't, hasn't ended very well, at least so far. This is Google Trends data for Glass over the last handful of years. You can see, although there was a big spike, a lot of interest in Glass around 2013, 2014, it's sort of dipped from there. Now, Glass, I guess, Glass's sort of fall wasn't necessarily only due to augmented reality. Uh, users had some very legitimate privacy concerns about people wearing a camera that could take pictures and videotapes at any time. There's also the small problem that Glass cost $1,500, uh, which didn't exactly make it a pragmatic purchase for your average consumer. And you'll see this for a lot of these, these uh, wearables as well. I, it's one problem in the AR space is to get a powerful enough computer that can wear here, you, you run into some problems and it's not exactly the easiest thing to manufacture. Now, I will say that it'll be interesting maybe five or ten years from now, whether we look back at glass sort of the way that we look at the low puck, sort of something that led, you know, it was sort of an early innovator a little bit too soon in the field. Because glass did really have some good ideas, like the ability to see directions right through your face. I ran into this earlier today. You know, I always feel like an idiot. I was walking to my hotel and I've got my, my phone out and trying to carry three things. How much easier would it be to just be able to directly see directions? So a lot of other good ideas Glass had, and it's also led to a bunch of other companies start to play in the wearable field. How many people know what this one is? A couple of hands. So this is the Microsoft HoloLens. And if you've watched any of the last handful of Microsoft keynotes, you know that they've been investing in this pretty heavily, pushing their HoloLens technology, trying to get into this space as well. HoloLens also has the problem that it's, it's not a cheap purchase. <laughs> Microsoft is sort of purposely targeting more of an industrial business user, sort of the, the use case they talk about all the time is some, somebody working in some sort of uh, line setting and having this augmented display so they can see different instructions and gauges and those sorts of things as well. The last thing I'll mention before we get into some demos is this one called Magic Leap. Has anybody heard of this company before? So I see a handful of, uh, of hands. I only mention this because this company has raised something like $2 billion to date. I think their biggest backer is Google. So there's a lot of money going into this. Now they claim to have some, some patented technology that I, I don't totally understand. It, it somehow ties into, they've got a different way of, I don't know, perceiving depth in their AR experiences, which has led to all the VC money. I include this just to show that there's a lot of interest in, in AR. It's, it's clearly enough people are willing to invest in this. This company, though, I, I'm skeptical as, as most of the tech world because they, they've yet to produce anything. So uh, time will tell whether this is something that is going to be a real innovation in the AR space or just a, another failure there. OK, so that's the history. That's sort of your brief run up to AR. Now you'll notice that the one thing I totally admitted from that history is AR on devices like this, right? Phones and tablets and such. And I did that both because AR on these devices, at least sort of built-in APIs to build AR experiences, is really new. It's really only hit iOS and Android within the last year, so it really deserves to be at the end of the history. But I think it's important because really most of AR development right now is happening on iOS and Android. Even if these wearables are sort of the, the end goal of AR, right now they're not really developer approachable, right? Unless you work on Magic Leap, you don't know what's going on here. Uh, HoloLens does have a development kit, but again, you're building for a small subset of users. Not many people are walking around with HoloLenses. Whereas everybody's got one of these, a lot of people have one of these. A lot of people now have devices that are capable of running these experiences. So that's why most development going on right now is for Android and iOS. And that's also why I'll just be focusing on that today. So AR today. The other reason that this is the AR on phones is so big is that there's, there's a big arms race now between Apple and Google to sort of provide the best AR APIs to help build their platforms up. 
So this is from last fall, Apple's keynote. They, re they announced that they were releasing a series of APIs they call AR Kit for iOS and that shipped with iOS 11. And then Google, not to be outdone, announced AR Core, of course, with a slightly different name. I, I think Google was actually the first to announce. It's, it's a similar series of APIs. It's basically a building block for help, to help you build AR apps on Android. Now, right now, device support looks like this. So if you want to build AR kit apps, basically you have to have an iPhone 6S Plus or above, as well as some of the newer iPads. This again comes down to just sheer processing power. Apple says that the reason that that cutoff is in place is there's a certain chipset that's in the 6S Plus and up, and they want you to have at least that chipset to run these. The story is somewhat similar with AR Core. Um, actually, Google just updated this list fairly recently. I had to update this slide earlier today because it used to be just the Pixel devices and the Galaxy S8, and now they have uh, some additional devices as well. And actually, Google just announced that AR Core 1.0 just shipped. This was about two weeks ago. It was in developer preview for a long time. So I know Google's been working with a lot of their hardware partners and vendors and such to try to get AR Core to more devices. But because iOS has shipped ARKit in iOS 11, that's the biggest landscape of apps that are out there. And that's also, for NativeScript, the thing that we focused on first. We built for ARKit, it was out on iOS, it's been available for several months. So I'm gonna be focusing on iOS for the rest of this talk, And but although, just know that AR Core is fairly similar, I'll try to point out some of the differences I know of as we go through this. Now, iOS 11 shipped last fall, right? ARKit APIs. So, you would think that with developers had six months to work with these amazing set of APIs that they had built, these life-altering, you know, really compelling experiences. Uh, so, I, I, I toured the iOS App Store for you, I've done the work for you, and unfortunately I've not found these life-changing apps. Instead, I found a bunch of uh, lightsaber apps, there's Sudoku apps, the Fart app is actually kind of fun. It's, it's kind of worth downloading. And really overall, I'm just going to read this headline because it sums it up pretty well. Despite Apple's hype, adoption of ARKit has been slow. And actually, if you look at, this is Aptopia, which is a mobile analytics firm. They estimate that there are under 1,000 apps on the App Store using ARKit. And at the scale that Apple operates, I mean, that's ridiculously trivial, right? Uh, and that data is through, it's through the end of 2017, so it's not quite a big, but that's still a crazy low amount of applications. So I do want to show you some of these. I think it's, I think it's important that you know these things exist. So what I'm going to do is, will you mirror my iPad here? This is again where I need a little loading indicator. So I use a QuickTime to mirror my screen. And QuickTime is both my favorite and least favorite application. When it works, it's, see, there you go. That's always nice. Uh, when it works, it's actually really good. Uh, when it doesn't work, you get this sort of thing. And sometimes you have to hard kill it. But it's great for, if you ever need to present something to a group, it's really quite good. And there we go, not responding. It's always my favorite part of any presentation. Let's try again. If you do new movie recording, there we go. This this is like the recommended workflow in the QuickTime documentation. You try it once, of course, it works. <laughs> you go back in. Uh, but like I said, when it works, it works really well. Like this is sort of right, like real time monitoring. It also works offline. Why I use it in presentations because a lot of engineering software you actually have to go through Wi Fi and at events that doesn't work so well. Okay, so I have a handful of amazing AR applications here. I'm going to start with the IKEA Place app. This is sort of the canonical AR kit application. If you look up anything for iOS uh, AR, you'll probably find this app. It, it uses the, the API so perfectly, it's almost like a tutorial to walk you through the apps that are available. So the way this works, this is an IKEA app. You have to detect a plane, so we got here. Then you look through the amazing IKEA furniture. Let's say we want a little couch here. And you gotta find a spot that wants to place right here, sure. And you <laughs> place the couch down. Now, 
what's, this is a little bit silly, but what's kind of cool about this, what ARKit does for you is, first of all, it has APIs to help you detect planes. So IKEA didn't have to hand code where, how do I find a flat surface from the camera. It also provides a way to add 3D models. So IKEA has this collection of 3D models. ARKit provides a way to place those down. And really the fun thing is that you'll notice this couch stays in place and it'll also stay in place. You know, I could go walk across this room, walk around, and lo and behold, the couch is still there. So you can imagine, even though this is kind of silly, actually putting some furniture around your house, moving things around, this is actually one of the more useful AR apps that is out there. So that's IKEA Place. Uh, I'll, I'll show you at least one or two silly ones because I think that's important to do as well. So this is Giphy World, and this app is completely pointless and useless. But it does show some of what AR Kit does because you can also put just random things. And again, it'll remember, right? Because we wouldn't want to forget that those, those gifts are there. <laughs> there they are hanging out out there. Uh, so that's one. This, let's see, Magic Sudoku, this, I don't know if I call this useful, but it's just cool. Uh, you can look up, the, the person behind this has a really good technical write-up, but basically what it does is point this thing at a Sudoku puzzle, so we'll go here, and I don't know why the diagonal happened there, but uh, it sort of solves it in place. Now, this is using, so it uses ARKit to actually detect the plane again. But it's obviously its own custom code to sort of pull out the numbers from the image and to solve it. But it's again then using AR kit to remember that position so we can place the solved puzzle back where that was. So again, it's, it's a pretty cool, I don't know if I would necessarily call it useful, uh, but kind of cool. Uh, now, AR kit, just to, to sort of back up a bit, it's, it's basically just a series of APIs for doing a few of the things I, I said, like adding planes, adding things to the real world, using positioning. But of course, I mean, augmented reality just means <coughs> digital things in the real world, and you don't have to use AR kit, you don't have to use AR core to build these things. They're just helpers, right? And a lot of the best apps that do AR things on the App Store really aren't using AR kit at all, and were out there before AR kit was a thing. Uh, Pokemon Go, when it came out, was not using AR kit. It was all just sort of hand coded things. So I'll show you about, uh, I think I got two or three of these. So first of all, I discovered there are a ton of makeup apps on the iOS App Store, and they are really good. So is it this one? I don't know. No, no, I want you can makeup, of course. So you go in here. It, it's sort of like Snapchat-y like, but what I, I might have to take my hand out. But, like, I, I, I get very impressed with how good this is, right? Like this. <laughs> You can see yourself in a whole different light. There are a lot of these apps out there. You can think of like Snapchat too. The like Snapchat face face swap, those sort of things. Those are all AR experiences as well. Uh, the last one I'll show is Google Translate. Are people familiar with this app? Can they show up hands? I think it's a few people, but I like demoing it anyways. So my wife and I took oops, I lost my mic, so give me a second. Uh, my wife and I took a trip to Rome about uh, eight or nine years ago, and we bought this thing as a souvenir. But I, some, for some reason, I bought the Dutch version of this. I, <laughs> I don't know why. But what's funny is that this thing sat on a shelf, and like eight or nine years later, I needed something in a foreign language, and I was like, it's going to finally be useful. I have a use for it. So the way this, this app works, let's see, I still got my phone here. So basically, you take your camera, and it can do like inline translations. Let me find something in Dutch. And you can see that, oh, like the costume wow. yesterday and today. Um, it, it's hard with like big blocks of text. You can sometimes get it, right? But it works better on um, like little one liners, like Roman forum there. And I've used this a ton on like trips. Like it works really well if you need to read a street sign or uh, like a menu or something like that. So again, not using AR kit, but just showing the power of AR, like the sort of things that could be done. You can imagine this sort of thing in sort of some sort of headset as well, too. Like imagine just walking around and being able to read all the street signs and such, too. So that's sort of what the potential of uh, what AR makes possible. And so to go back to here, let's see if this remembers this. OK, so all right, yeah, we're seeing this. Now, I, the one thing I want to sort of bookmark is 
there's not a whole lot of AR kit apps out there, and there's also not a whole lot of good ones. And I have some theories for why, so I'm gonna come back to that at the very end of this talk. But I do wanna wrap up, and I do wanna show you how to actually build these things, right? I wanna, I wanna show some code, build some Angular apps to, to do this sort of thing. I'm gonna be using NativeScript to do this. Of course, I am a NativeScript person on the NativeScript team, so I'll give you a little intro to NativeScript as we go through coding this. I will say, in fairness though, uh, React Native has a pretty good AR kit plugin as well. It works pretty similarly to NativeScript, but of course you're using React instead of Angular. Uh, so they have an AR kit plugin. This is the NativeScript one. If you just search NativeScript AR, uh, you'll find it out there, and that's what I'll be using. But for the most part, I'm going to switch here and show you what this actually looks like. So I'll be building an app for the iPad. So I'm going to bring that over here kill this and bring up my, my basic Hello World app over here. And actually, just to show you, I'll crank this up a little bit. Now, first of all, I should ask the room, how many people are familiar with NativeScript at all? Okay, so only a handful of people. So I, I, I'll give you the, the sort of brief intro. When you're building apps with <coughs> NativeScript, you're building an Angular app, but you're building an Angular app for iOS and Android. Now, the key difference with NativeScript is that we are not rendering to the web at all. So we are not a project like uh, Cordova, PhoneGap, Ionic that's actually rendering web content. We are rendering completely native iOS and Android controls. Now, for what it means for when you're actually building your app is your app mostly looks like an Angular application. So if I just sort of quickly skim through the file tree, you'll see some patterns that should look fairly familiar. Um, really, we're, we're trying to stick to the core Angular conventions as much as we possibly can. You can actually use the Angular CLI in NativeScript apps to do things like generate components and such as part of your application. But the one thing that is very much different, you again might recognize some of the syntax. This is just a component, like you build a component for any Angular application. Uh, the class is going to be fairly similar. But what's going to be different is this template here. Now, the biggest thing that you have to learn to build uh, NativeScript apps is the template. Because with NativeScript, you know, we don't have, we can try to put divs and spans in there, they don't work because there are no divs on iOS, there are no divs on Android. So you have to use our components because our components are actually implemented with iOS and Android code. So when you type action bar here, we're actually rendering a UI navigation bar on iOS, we're uh, rendering an Android widget action bar on Android for you. So it is cross-platform. You are building for multiple platforms at the same time. And the same is true of our AR experience right now. We support ARKit, but we wrote it in a cross-platform way, so eventually you could use the same APIs to hit ARKit and uh, AR Core for Android. We're, we're starting work on AR Core now that Google shipped the 1.0 release of that. So this is what your basic app looks like. Uh, I wouldn't worry too much about the syntax. The, the other thing I should point out is even though you're using some tags that are a little bit unfamiliar, you'll notice that the same angularisms within the template still apply. So this is the same sort of ng if you would use in a web app. Uh, you could use the same sort of data binding and event binding. Those things still hold true. It's just a set, new set of components. And the key component in this case is this AR tag. Now again, I, I don't want you to get too caught up on the syntax here. So basically, the action bar is just gonna be a bar on the top of the screen. Grid layout is just being used to just make the AR experience take up the entire screen. That's all you really need to know for now. Uh, really, I just want you to focus on this AR tag. And I think the easiest way to do this is to actually see this. So with NativeScript, uh, NativeScript is something you install through NPM. You go to command line utility called TNS, which is short for Telerik NativeScript. And then I'm just going to run this thing for iOS. So this is gonna do a iOS build. We're using Xcode under the hood. So this, we are building native applications. And it's gonna push this out uh, to my iPad because I've got the iPad connected through USB. And you should see the app right here. So I've got the action bar I defined here, and then the AR part is the rest of the screen you, you see here. And what we're doing is, you know, under the hood, we're using AR kit to actually implement these APIs, but they're sort of abstracted from you, so you don't have to deal with the nitty-gritty iOS code here. Now, what's happening is there's a few attributes you can provide. So the first is this debug level. 
So most AR apps were, uh, sort of work by detecting a plane. If you think of the IKEA Place app, it needed to know, needed to find a flat surface. And they even included instructions. They, they flashed by kind of quick, but it, it, let's say like, hold your device out and move it slowly to find a flat surface. So you can, ARKit has this concept of debug level built in, and that's what the, the yellow dots you, saw, you see uh, in, it's basically ARKit telling you, I'm, I'm close to finding a plane here, right? So more yellow dots means I, I'm close to finding something. And even though it's considered a debug mode, I've seen some ARKit apps just leave it on in production and just tell the user to actually point, you know, to find the yellow dots to help find a plane. Because as it turns out, one of the biggest problems I run into is that finding planes is not all that stable on ARKit. Supposedly, it's a little bit better in AR Core, so I need to, to play with it a little bit. But it, you'll see when I demo this uh, how that works in action. The next is plane material. So you can configure what this, the actual plane that's being rendered uh, here looks like. And we provide a few options. So uh, right now, I'm just setting it to this sort of transparent white. But what I can do is I'm going to change this to, oh, not that one, I need this one. So you can provide, I think most, some apps don't even provide a plain material at all. Like in Ikea Place, they didn't tell you where the floor is necessarily. So it sort of depends on the app whether you need this sort of thing at all. You can see, oh, there we go. You can see like the Tron like squares there. So you can do this sort of thing as well. You can sort of configure it to whatever makes sense for the application that you're building. I'm gonna leave Tron on there for now. So in Interscript, we, we expose, yeah, question. What's that? Oh. Oh, okay, yep, you can. So it's just pointing at a, a PNG in this case. Thanks, thanks for pointing that out. I'll go also expand this when I'm in the code. So in NativeScript, we expose a bunch of the underlying ARKit APIs for things like uh, events or actions that you might commonly want to take. And so I'll show one of these. I've got uh, three or four of these things to show you. And one of them is we provide this event. I feel like a type in there. So we expose. <coughs> ARKit tells you after you detect the plane when the user taps on it or does something with it. And so ARKit provides that event. We expose it through Angular syntax. So again, just event binding the same way you do it in, Ang in an Angular web app. And what I'm going to do is add that event handler. And we have this method called addbox. And as you might expect, this goes here. Uh, This is my favorite part of these talks, is trying to find plane. There we go. Um, and it just adds a box. And if you go look at the code, what I'm doing is you can provide a position. So you can tell it to add it wherever. In this case, I'm just, uh, I get the position that the user actually taps. So I'm just saying put the box there. You can go crazy with this. I, I will say that <laughs> the performance of ARKit is actually quite good. Like, I've, I've went nuts with this I, sort of thing. You can also do this weird uh, thing where they, they sort of fall off into infinity <laughs> here as well, which is oddly satisfying to play with. But again, um, you know, with NativeScript, we're not doing anything special here. We're just exposing what ARKit does. So there's some good and, and some bad. What's good is you get, like, this collision detection built in. Any t anybody who's tried to code this sort of thing yourself knows that, like, you don't want to touch that. Uh, and it, it actually works quite well, although it looks like it just froze up on me there. Uh, the second, I think I lost it. Let's go back. You hit the box in there. I think I did. I think I broke it. Uh, after I was just saying that it does pretty well, like memory <laughs> performance wise, so. Blank quick time. Uh, yeah, I blame quick time. Uh, what I was going to say with my iPad is in some sort of weird state here is that it also does the you know, remembering the position out of the box as well. So it knew where those boxes are, were and it continued to remember them. This app is just like toast or something. That is really weird. I don't even know what I'm seeing. Oh, all right. I think I'm back in business. Let me see if I can add a box again to see. What's that? Oh, yeah, yeah, thank you. 
so yeah, I, I was able to add a box. So I'll, I'll show you, there's two or three other things I, I want to show. Uh, you can also add other, there's a bunch of polygons built into ARKit. So for example, I can add circles. And I'll also show that you know, you, ARKit exposes some events like uh, the user tap on an individual model. So like I, the IKEA place app would do that. So if you tap a piece of furniture, maybe you want to move it around. Maybe you want to show some tooltip when the user clicks on something. Those are APIs that are built in. This map kit. Oh, man. We'll just do <coughs> this. Live demos are the, the best. <laughs> These things always go so well. Um, but in case this doesn't know, maybe it's going to work for me. You, you wouldn't want to miss the, the spheres. It's, it's very so exciting. Let's see if I can get the plane again. There you go. All right, there we go. So that's an ah. You're totally missing. <coughs> so spheres again. So again, this is not life altering, right? Uh, but it just sort of shows how some of the you get some of the physics for this sort of thing. Built right in. Again, we're not doing anything special with native script. Um, so I'll do, I've got two more examples to show. One other event that I'm going to tie to, uh, bind to, is just when the thing loads itself. So you don't have to use planes to work with ARKit. You can just, like if you think of the Giphy app where I was just throwing GIFs out into the real world. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a loaded event, and what I'm going to do with it is just add some text out of the real. So as soon as, as soon as the thing loads, we're going to get some text. And I hard-coded these positions, so I don't know where the text is going to be. This is going to be like a little search up there. It is. So native script oh, you're still up here. Oh. I'm going to have to switch my this so I don't forget that again. Um, so yeah, so it becomes a little search, and I found native script <laughs> up here. Now, this is kind of silly, but actually one of the, the coolest ideas I've seen out there is there's this company working on uh, this app where you can view city skyscapes, uh, sky, you know, uh, skylines is the word I was looking for. So imagine you're out like looking at Seattle from afar. You're out on the ocean and you see tall buildings. Well, imagine you could point your phone at the skyline and it would label it, say, like, put text, right? Like, oh, that's, that's the space needle and that's this sort of thing. And you could use the events to, like, tap it and skip, like, a little dial that says, oh, this is what this is, and get some background information on that. So I know there's a company working on it, which is one of the more compelling cases I, I've seen with AR. What I've discovered is that these APIs are hard as hell to work with, though. Like, I just made up those position numbers. You can see that I'm just using complete gibberish, right, for, for all of these. And, and we're just exposing what ARKit has under the hood. And I wouldn't want to, like, actually, <laughs> I, to find the exact space positions you need to, like, label things in the real world is incredibly <laughs> difficult. So the APIs are there, but they're still kind of hard to use to build practical things. The, the very last, I've got one last example here, and then see. So instead of adding spheres, the, the spheres are kind of cool to show as well as the boxes, but you know, you're probably not going to ship a production app that puts you know, orange boxes down on the screen. What you'll usually do is work with 3D models. So if you think the IKEA place app, the, the furniture. Uh, I've got one for just a basic ball. I discovered through testing that this ball is enormous, so we'll see how this, oh, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> I've got, oh, that you one. Can you can adjust the scale. You can adjust the scale, yeah. Um, so I could have brought, <laughs> I'm walking into the ball now. I could have brought this down. Uh, but again, the APIs, at least through DataScript, are, are pretty easy to use. Uh, turning in all these things into a useful app is a, a little more challenging. Uh, so before I start to wrap up, does anybody have any questions about the, the code itself? Uh, sort of the, the app and what it's doing? Yeah. So one thing I noticed, like you've got all of this in line in your template. Do you just like have that pulled out like you might normally do with like your HTML, CSS, whatever that you normally just say, here's a link to? Or does it need to be stuck in here? Yeah, so the question is about uh, templates and uh, everything being in line. And you can totally split it up is the answer. So just like, uh, and in fact, maybe I, I, so I keep everything, 
So yeah, it's like the earlier version of this in a separate file. So you can use template URL just like you would do in any good web app. You can also use is it style URLs, that sort of thing. That works in NativeScript as well. I keep things in line just so it's easier to demo, so everything's right there, so I don't have to jump back and forth. But you can split it up exactly like you would do in any good web app. Yeah. Does AR Core have the uh, like polygon ones and the other stuff? Like where does how much of this is just AR? Uh, so I don't, I can't give you a good thorough answer because I haven't played with AR Core. I know AR Core has plane detection, and I've, I've heard that it's actually better than AR could, at least in terms of detecting non, you know, services that have a little blemishes. AR kit like totally falls apart with that sort of thing. Uh, beyond that, I don't really know. Um, but again, like I, I think, I think they do have polygon APIs as well. They definitely have the ability to have models as well. And it's, but it's the same thing, though. In, in native script, it will be. We, our AR core implementation is in progress like right now, so it hasn't shipped quite yet. Yeah? Does it provide any uh, marker identification APIs? Uh, right now, we were placing everything on the screen. So, something related to like, object identification or uh, like the yeah, so the question is whether there's any APIs to like sort of detect the marker or a position. And to my knowledge, no. That's not the sort of thing that's built in. And I've actually struggled with that as well. I, I don't know for sure whether that's not in there. I do know that, so the, the new version of ARKit is going to, there's a new version shipping with iOS 11.3, and the new things they're adding is the ability to detect uh, vertical surfaces. So right now, all planes are horizontal, so they're adding the ability to detect uh, vertical ones, so like if you wanted to stick digital things in a wall or that sort of thing. Uh, and they're also adding some facial recognition stuff, uh, specifically for the iPhone 10 because they've got the like, face ID camera. Uh, but that's the extent of uh, what I know about what they're shipping for that. And, yeah? So to develop <coughs> with that native script, I'm sure add to uh, your iPad. So we can, can you do this from a Windows machine, or we have to go from an iPad? So from a Windows machine, you can develop for Android. We have something known as NativeScript Sidekick, which lets you sort of upload your iOS provisioning material, and we will let you do iOS builds through that. Uh, but if you're using the command line interface from Windows, you can only build for Android. Any other questions? Yeah. Do you have a renderer that outputs to HTML? Like I can see for you plugging, it would be handy to just have a web view that's somewhat yeah. related. So the question is whether we render a, whether you can render HTML through NativeScript. And the answer today is no. It's something we've sort of experimented with. Um, and there are certain cases, like we do support Flexbox for layout, so uh, there is some potential to sort of create a web renderer. It's, it's theoretically possible, and we have some people that have sort of experimented with it, but right now we don't have that. Yeah? Uh, sort of the last thing, I think some people kind of touched on this. Would it, like your football field and drawing a line on, it would put the line underneath the players but on top of the field. And I'm noticing with some of the things here, it looks like like with the, uh, the couch thing, which is sort of like clip right through your desk. Are they doing more like real world object identification? Is that kind of No, so yeah, that's been one problem, and I, I've got a couple uh, a video here in a minute of some of my failures with, with AR kit. Uh, but yeah, it, it's really bad at detecting like other objects that might be in the way. And I, I've heard that some of the problem is that there's no, the, the back facing cameras on phones have no way of picking up, there's no depth sensor in them right now. Uh, and I, I actually, when I talked, I gave this talk once before and somebody came up to me afterwards from Motorola and said that they were considering adding like a, a depth sensor to their camera to better able to detect those sorts of things. Because I think it's more technological that they just don't, they, they don't have a good way of knowing those things are actually there to render around them, at least in these tiny little devices. Google actually shipped a tablet with the depth sensor. So, okay. what, what tablet? It was Project Tango. Um, okay. It didn't do that well. It was yeah. like the thing you get on the phone. And that's what, when I was talking to the guy from, from Motorola, I started, he was wondering, like, 
I think he said it would cost something like $20, $25. You know, it add that to the cost of the phone. And my thought is like, I, unfortunately, like for better or worse, like I don't think the average consumer is like, yeah, I really need a depth sensor on my phone so my augmented reality experiences are marginally better. Like it's, it's also <laughs> really not primary. Okay. 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 Any other questions? Yeah. How do you feel the Pokemon Go implementation of their augmented reality compares to the AR kit? And would they benefit at all, do you feel? Or? So they so they did switch to AR kit and let me see if I can catch Pokemon here, if there's any in this in this building. So the initial version of Pokemon Go's AR, the Pokemon would just sort of float in front of the camera and it would sort of move with the camera. So now that they're using AR kit, the Pokemon will actually sort of stay in place and the most interesting thing I've, I've seen about this is now it's spawned, like a lot of people do Pokemon Go like photography, because since the Pokemon will stay there, you can sort of crouch up next to it and, and take, <laughs> take a cool picture of it. So it actually has benefited from it. And there's actually a lot of demand in the Pokemon Go community for them to implement AR Core now, because the Android users are a little upset. Uh, so this is my wife's account, so she's gonna catch a Pokemon here. Uh, so the way this works is they have a little AR switch up here, and so yeah, make, sure, make sure you're in a safe location. They, they don't want you playing Pokemon Go and like going out on the road and catching it. So again, you can see they have the instructions slowly look around. Uh, they do a kind of cool thing, they, you know, they sort of theme the plane so it's, it actually looks like it fits into the environment. And then uh, you can see they're, they're, to your point, they found the plane, but it put the Pokemon, like it didn't know, like, oh, there's a wall there, right? Like, clipped it into that. Uh, but I could, it'll stay there, right? In previous versions, the Pokemon would move around with you, but now, who Hoot stays right there and he's gonna run away from me because uh, I got too close. But that's basically the change. So it actually has benefited from, uh, from updating the AR kit. Any other questions? Okay, so I have one last thing that I'm gonna wrap up with. So I go to my presentation here. Uh, if you remember, I, I sort of left one point open of why aren't there better AR apps out there? Why hasn't somebody built something really cool with AR Kit or AR Core quite yet? And the conclusion I've come to, sort of through my own experimentation, is that AR is still really hard. If you think of the apps that I showed that were successful or were really, really good, uh, they're massive engineering numbers. So Snapchat, for instance, right? Snapchat has really good AI experiences. Well, it turns out they spent a ton of engineering time building these things. And in many cases, they spent a lot of money buying companies that are sort of purpose built for creating some of these experiences. Uh, the same is true for, remember Google Translate app? It's actually, Google bought this company called WordLens, that you know, sort of purpose built this sort of thing. Uh, so these aren't the things that your average developer is just gonna pick up AR kit and like whip out a, a handy little lab. Uh, it's really easy to get started with the basics. Like you, can, you can add boxes and spheres and stuff right away, but taking that next step to building something that's really compelling and useful is actually really difficult. And I sort of found this, my, my best app idea, right? I wanted to walk in here and show you like a really cool app that I built, I'd show you where it is in the app store, you tell your friends, your parents, and it would be really great. Uh, instead, you saw me like throwing boxes on the screen, right? Like it didn't quite turn out quite as I hoped. But the best idea I had, so I had this app idea that it would be like put cars in your driveway. I, I need some like hipster names, so you can talk to me later about that. But the idea is it would detect your driveway and you'd say like, I want a Ferrari in my driveway, right? And I want a Formula One car next to that. And then I'm gonna pose in the picture with them and send it to my friends, right? This is my app idea. So that's what it looked like in my head. When I actually tried to build this, uh, this is the sort of thing that happened <laughs> Because Air Kit like had no idea like it's it's really bad at detecting large open flat surfaces. Um, IKEA the IKEA app actually is quite good. I I'd actually really like to talk to the people behind it. They did a pretty good job of keeping the furniture from falling into infinity. So they they've done something that I'm not aware of how to do. But this is sort of the challenge right now. So this talk is somewhat eclectic. But the best way I can sum it up is. Is a, first of all, AR is really cool, right? There are some really compelling ideas. Like, I think there's a real future for the technology. I think there's a future for wearables. But in the short term, AR is also really hard. Now, this isn't a technology that you're gonna pick up and 
build an amazing app for right away. Sure, you can add some 3D models, you can do some basic things right away, but you have to be ready to roll up your sleeve or put your money where your mouth is if you want to build something really good. So I think it's probably a few more years before AR is really simple enough for your average person like me to build apps using these technologies. Now the good news is there's really an arms race right now between Apple and Google to add more and more of these AR APIs. So I think this arms race is actually going to benefit this ecosystem quite a bit, right? The more that these two companies add these APIs that we can use, ideally the, the better AR experiences we have. So if you're interested in any of this, uh, if you find NativeScript interesting at all, if you go to nativescript.org, there's a big green getting started button. Uh, there's a tutorial for NativeScript and Angular that will walk you through comprehensively sort of how to build an app. From there, if you Google the NativeScript AR plugin, it's just a plugin that you can add with a single command and then you can start using the, the code I saw. We have some tutorials and blog posts specifically on using AR with NativeScript, so if you want to uh, replicate my amazing apps that I built up here, that good instructions on how to do that. So at this point, does anybody have any questions about you know, anything else at, at this point? About NativeScript, AR, anything else? I think so. So with that, I, I guess to say thank you. The last thing I'll note is I do have some swag, and I do not want to take it home to Michigan. Uh, <laughs> I do not know how to fairly distribute this, so I'm going to try to avoid a riot. But I've got a bag of some stuff. These, these stress balls are available. I do have plenty of stickers, so feel free to have, to help yourself with lots of stickers. Uh, otherwise, it's sort of first come, first serve. So, thank you.